thank you uh, for, first of all, I want to welcome the audience. Uh, thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, hope that you've had a nice time at the conference so far. We've had a good first day and a half. Um, we, uh, you know, one of the exciting things about this conference, a lot of talks and sessions about new and emerging uh, technologies and problem spaces and ideas and initiatives that we can all get excited about. But we uh, are, are here to talk about something a little bit different because we don't want to forget about a problem that has been with us for a while. Uh, and that is how do we uh, address and how do we approach uh, when our technologies, our products are entering uh, their end of life state. So real quick, uh, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Justin Murphy. Uh, I work for the US government for CISA. We are the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We have security in there twice, so you know we mean business. Uh, I am a vulnerability analyst at CISA. Uh, CISA is a component of the Department of Homeland Security. We're the federal lead for cybersecurity. If you don't know much about us, uh, we focus on uh, understanding, managing, and reducing the risk to our nation's critical infrastructure. I'm a vulnerability analyst, uh, work in vulnerability management. I do co coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, also been involved with some of the SBOM and VEX work. Uh, over my few years at CISA. <clears throat> I'm also involved with some standards bodies, if you're familiar with uh, OASIS Open, the International uh, Standards SDO. Uh, I, I'm part of the Common Security Advisory Framework uh, standards body, uh, Open EOX, which we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, later in this presentation about. Uh, and just for fun, uh, I, I, I like hiking, I like, ex like exploring. I'm looking forward to exploring uh, Vienna later in this week. Uh, and, and getting out on the golf course. I'm gonna let uh, my colleague Victoria introduce herself and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria. I think this mic works. Um, also at CISA, some of you may know my name or my face from last week's SBOMorama or the various SBOM related emails that hit your inboxes. At CISA, I work for Alan Friedman who had CISA's SBOM work. Uh, so that's usually what I'm doing all day, every day. Um, when I'm not doing that, I'm also working on some international cooperation stuff but centered around SBOM. And in my free time, I am knitting. I brought some with me on the plane, had a great time. And I love coffee, so I'm thriving in Vienna. And before we go any further, I want to flag. Um, you may think to yourself, wow, this talk kind of looks similar to one that Alan gave uh, recently. And he gave me full permission to steal as much from him as I wanted. <laughs> Great, so uh, now you know who we are. Um, we, uh, will this be worth your time? We hope that that's why you're here, and the answer is yes. We hope that when you leave, you still feel the same. Uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, why, first of all, why are we here talking about end of life and end of support software at Open Source Summit Europe? Uh, why do we think it's important? Why do, we, why do we think you should think it's important, if you don't already? Uh, we'll do what we love to do in security, admire the problem a little bit. Uh, that's the easy part. And then we'll even dabble in the difficult part, which is talking about identifying a solution or some paths forward. We're going to talk about some work that's going on, uh, maybe uh, talk even a little bit of how you could get involved with that work. And then uh, we'll talk, you know, what we at CISA feel are some of those potential paths forward and taking inspiration uh, from some of the other projects that we've been working on, that we're still working on, uh, in, the, in that domain of supply chain security uh, and transparency. Thank you. So, uh, I think this is a good place to start if we're going to kind of uh, put it in pr into perspective of why do we care about this problem. We can ask ourselves a few questions. Why, uh, or why do we care? How old is your cell phone? Um, uh, I would say actually this crowd is probably pretty up to date with uh, emerging technologies, but I know that my mother, my dear sweet mother back in the United States, uh, she still has the iPhone that has the uh, auxiliary port, the headphone jack, which I think that hasn't been supported since like iPhone 7. Uh, she takes really good care of her devices, which is great. Um, you know, we can also ask our questions like, how old's your car? And we, we've seen instances in the news that newer vehicles being shipped with uh, obsolete technologies with known vulnerabilities in them. Uh, we, know, we see our VPN appliances getting older. Uh, we see our home routers and our operating systems you know, going out of date or end of support. 
Um, and so that's the stuff that we use on a daily basis that we're directly connected to and we, we have that connection every day to. What about when our loved ones are entering their end of life and we are talking about medical device security? We're lucky if those devices are shipped with modern operating systems. Uh, what about, we're, we work for CISO, we're responsible for securing our nation's critical infrastructure. What about when we start talking about operational technology and ICS? Uh, that's where legacy software, where obsolete, out-of-date software and hardware uh, is ubiquitous. It's literally everywhere. And so, I didn't know I put animations on the side. <laughs> uh, so we have, uh, you know, we have an example here on the bottom where we see some of our home routers. Uh, here's a security notification, home routers end of life. See at the top right, if you use Microsoft Windows 10, it's going to be end of support in October of next year. Better update. Uh, some things to point out about this. Uh, human readable. Uh, if you're in the vulnerability management space, you know that a lot of our processes are still very manual, so you have to go and search for this data in a lot of cases. Great that they provide it. The big software companies, you know, they have maybe some declared or established uh, ways of dealing with end of life, end of support, but really throughout the ecosystem, that's not the case. It's, it's some, often you don't know when something's end of life, end of support. Text is kind of small. One thing I want to point out, uh, the bottom one right here, it says, uh, this is end of support. What do they recommend? Replace it. Uh, when Windows is end of support, what do you do? We recommend you buy a new device. Um, you replace it, right? So we're talking about our operating systems on our PCs. We're talking about our cell phones. We're talking about our home routers. Maybe that's okay. I don't really want to. One thing that it actually says on these is these things will still work, but we recommend that you Rip and replace. Well, when we're starting to talk about our car, bigger expense, when we're starting to talk about our nation's critical infrastructure, uh, things that can't be turned off, things that weren't meant to be turned off, things that weren't meant to break. If the phrase in the ICS community is, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. Um, things that we can't update very easily or at all because you're talking about lives, you're talking about national security, you're talking about our critical infrastructure. How do we handle that? Right? And so there really is no standard method of determining or communicating when something is end of life uh, or, or end of support at this point. If you've been tracking the, uh, over the past several months, the Avanti vulnerabilities. Uh, so a Avanti uh, Pulse Connect box, uh, fully patched. Intrinsically, inherently not vulnerable if fully patched. However, if you are to look a little bit deeper in the, into the components of that device, uh, you know, something that we don't have direct visibility into right away, you look into some of the pieces, uh, you're starting to see things that are eight years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 plus years old, uh, part of the components that make up that device. That's literally everywhere on the edge of the internet direct entry points into organizations, right? And so inherently, intrinsically, you know, when you're purchasing this fully patched, we're not saying that it's insecure, but you're going to raise your eyebrow when you start looking at what's making up that, that piece of software. And then, of course, we have XZ. Uh, once again, point here is we're talking about uh, how old is my software? And in this case, this is a supply chain issue, right? Who's, uh, uh, who's touching our software, right? So here's, here's uh, just some examples of some why this is a big problem. Why do we care? Uh, let's assign a dollar value to it. Article out of the Wall Street Journal, somebody estimated that this is a $1.5 trillion problem. So do you remember those examples where I showed you the Windows operating system when I showed you uh, the uh, wireless routers? Um, okay, is it realistic uh, for those to be replaced? Maybe so, but when we're, once again, when we're talking about our uh, critical infrastructure, our industrial control systems and things like that. No, it's not realistic. So this is a huge, huge problem uh, when we're talking about uh, monetary-wise as well. We're at a point where organizations are having 
to be faced with the decision of, is the cost higher to rip and replace? Or do I accept the risk that a national adversary is going to attack uh, our critical infrastructure and we just hope it doesn't happen, right? So that's, that's the problems that we're facing with this. Okay, so you might be wondering why are two people from the U.S. government here talking about end of life, end of, uh, end of support? Well, part of that reason, if you're familiar with the National Cybersecurity Strategy, came out towards the beginning of last year, 2023. Um, and this has really kind of the, been, over the last couple of years, the fund fundamental document in the U.S. government that's driving cybersecurity policy, uh, cybersecurity strategy. It's telling us what we at CISA, we have to do. Uh, uh, we'll go back one, one slide, and I'm going to read that. Uh, this comes from the National Cybersecurity Strategy. The administration will develop a process for identifying and mitigating the risk presented by unsupported software that is widely used or supports critical infrastructure. So our f focus, what we see as important, is we're talking about thing when these things break, when these things are attacked, we're talking about lives, potentially. We're talking about national security. That's why it's important for us. Next. And so what did they do with the National Cybersecurity Strategy? They came up with an implementation plan. And part of the implementation plan, uh, don't worry if you've already read it before I read it aloud, CISA will also explore requirements for a globally accessible database for end of life, end of support software, and convene an international staff level working group on SBOM. Check on one of those. Uh, not on the centralized database. Uh, we're probably going to shy away from that route. We're going to look into it because we're being asked to. We're exploring options and looking into this problem of end of life, end of support. That's why part of the reason we're here talking to you today and why we've been giving some public talks about it. Uh, we realize that centralized databases don't always work in security uh, th this day and age. Uh, it's a, you know, with the scale of software, maybe 20, 25 years ago it would have worked. But uh, it's something that we're looking into, uh, end of life, end of support. We realize it's a big problem. Uh, and and it, you know, here we are talking to you about it. So next. And before I hand it off to Victoria, she's going to start our process of admiring this problem. Another reason why we care. This is our former executive assistant director for cybersecurity, Eric Goldstein. He has now moved on to the private sector. Um, he gave a talk uh, earlier this year before he left about end of life and had to point out that we at the U.S. government might be one of the biggest, uh, you know, we are at maybe the most fault of using end-of-life legacy software. Um, so another reason why we care and think that is important and realize there's some work that needs to be done and we need to be a part of that work. I'm going to hand it over to Victoria now. So I know what you're all thinking. We're done. Great job. We all agree that it's a problem. Justin gave us multiple sources, except... We still have some questions that we need to work on. So we say EOL, EOS. What do we mean when we say end of life? Even more vague, what is the S when we say EOS? And then say we know exactly what we mean when we say end of life. We know what the S is. We know what it means. How do we fix the problem? Maybe we don't care about the definitions. We still don't actually know how to fix the problem that those acronyms describe. So to start us off on trying to figure out what we're actually talking about when we say the EOL, EOS problem, to start with end of life, sort of everyone agrees that L stands for life, so end of life. What we don't have agreement on is what that actually means. And I want to start off by flagging that end of life in and of itself is not a vulnerability, it's a risk. And that risk can be associated with vulnerabilities and patches and other things that come along when we talk about vulnerabilities. But it's a risk that comes along with this software entering this stage. And as we're thinking about definitions to get us sort of started, I'm going to put in front of you guys this definition of end of life from the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. Uh, so end of life is the life cycle stage of a product starting when the manufacturer no longer sells the product beyond their useful life as defined by the manufacturer and the product has gone through a formal EOL process, including notification to users. So if you're all thinking, that sounds almost exclusive to proprietary software and not really applicable to open source. I agree, put a pin in that and any other questions or reservations you have about this one. Onto EOS, 
So on this one, unlike with N EOL, end of life, we don't really have consensus on what that S stands for. So some places say, oh, it's end of support. Some places say end of service. We've also seen end of sales. And then again, as we're sort of thinking about what is this S, the definition from the same organization as before says, life cycle stage of a product starting when the manufacturer terminates all service support activities and service support does not extend beyond this point. Again, sounds pretty limited to the proprietary software use case. So we, I'd like you all to think about this next definition. And so if we look at the EOL problem, EOL US problem that we're talking about, looking at it from the security lens, can we reframe the problem as talking about support and define support as, it, as a reasonable expectation of a predictable, effective response to a new security risk? So when we are talking about the scary thing that we're afraid of when we say the EOL US problem, what we're afraid of is the producer or maintainer of a software component no longer updating that product in response to new information about risks. I threw a lot of information at you, and we're gonna come back to this, but as we continue to think about shaping these definitions and coming up with solutions, I would like to keep in mind that what we're looking for are definitions and solutions that work for both proprietary software and open source software. We wanna make sure that we're speaking the same language when we're thinking about these. Thank you, Victoria. So as Victoria is pointing out, right, uh, we do recognize that this problem, uh, we've been talking about it sort of right now, and we're gonna continue just very briefly. We know that this is Open Source Summit. Uh, it's not really the venue for this or the spirit of this venue or the aim of this venue, but it does help us set the stage for when we start talking about the issues that come with, with open source. We know that end of life, end of support means something different, or is it even really a thing, right? And we're gonna talk about that. So. Uh, let's just go through basic product life cycle. Um, typically, you you're going to have the introduction um, a phase, pretty straightforward, right? We're introducing this could be an open source library or you know open source piece of software, but typically you're talking about a commercial product, and hopefully once you introduce that, you have some element of growth, um, you have some maturity, and when you reach this stage, you know if you're talking about your product. Uh, probably typically or more likely you're talking about a version of the product is going into a stage of decline. That's when we're getting into talking about this, this part of end of life, end of support, end of sales, end of service. And so some of those definitions that we've seen on the proprietary side, we see end of sales. Uh, we also see some complications when we talk about the nuances that come with software and hardware. These are some of the things that we've seen organizations using. None of these apply to open source, right? Uh, this is a difficult part for even mature organizations that have mature processes for product lifecycle and how they deal with it. When you get into open source, uh, it's a real challenge for them. Here's another one that we've seen, <laughs> end of security support. Okay, end of security support, what about, are you still supporting the product, just not the security of it? Um, and then we really just get to end of support, which is probably if we had to pick one, maybe the most applicable to open source. But then you start getting into, is something ever truly end of in open source, right? Couldn't there be a, a hypothetical situation where something is labeled or not maintained, never actually labeled, but you see that it hasn't had any contributions in a while, but then some maintainer picks it back up or somebody else takes over the project. There's a lot of things to consider when we're talking about the open source world. So from this limited perspective of just looking at proprietary, the problem is a little bit easier. Um, you know, we can be, the problem could be addressed by standardizing. We love, everybody loves standards, right? Especially in open source. Uh, we are from the government, we love standards. I told you, I said on some standards bodies. Uh, so problem could be addressed by standardizing that communication of ELS. I told you, we're gonna be talking a little bit about some of the work that's being done, open EOX. Yes, that is taking into consideration a lot of uh, organizations, large software developers that are using proprietary software, but uh, or selling proprietary software, but uh, it also we are taking into consideration the open source community, and we need those voices. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
So easy for just dealing with proprietary software and we're gonna have a standard. Uh, for government uh, mandating things, right? We talked about the national cybersecurity strategy. They're telling us they want a centralized database, things like that. We know here in Europe, there's talks of when you're starting to sell a product, uh, you need to say up front how long you're gonna support that product. Not a bad, not a bad idea, but what determines how long your product's gonna be selling? You know, like uh, you, there's a lot of other factors that are gonna be who adopts your product, who's consuming your product, and how long is it on the market for? And all the different markets are gonna behave differently, right? So can you actually really predict how long you're gonna support something? That's something difficult. Uh, not a bad idea, not say, you know, not, that's just something to point out. But that's just for proprietary software, right? It's easy to come up with a standard. Uh, we can come up with regulations and, and mandate things, but we have to consider open source. And as Victoria pointed out, as I just pointed out, when you're talking about all these different terms, uh, they can mean different things when you're talking about proprietary versus open source. Uh, they cannot even make sense in the space of open source. And so we have to include open source as a part of this discussion. Uh, it, it's, as we come up with a common set of definitions that's gonna be able to apply to this really diverse community. Thank you. So now what you all are much more interested in, open source. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so OWASP has unmaintained software and outdated software among the top 10 concerns for open source software security. So hooray, again, big problem, we all agree. Next. Um, and we're gonna pause, because I want to assure you that, so that you know that we know that maintainers are not the same as software suppliers. I wanna make that clear, because I think we may not have had the best track record in the past on this, um, but we know that we put a lot of pressure and responsibility for security on the backs of maintainers who are doing this alone or with limited resources. And the price that we pay for putting so much onto maintainers is we make ourselves vulnerable to attacks like XZ happening. So now that we're all on the same page, we're, we now can talk about what support looks like in open source software. So like Justin went over for proprietary software, it's a little easier where a company like Wind at Microsoft can say, this uh, software component, we will stop updating it on March 6th. Here you hear you, we're done. There you go, customers, go on. So then customers either make a plan, so they're prepared for that date, or they panic when it comes because they didn't prepare. For open source, it's a little foggier because a maintainer of maintainers can, can say, okay, we'll be shutting down this project um, on this day, fork it if you want to, go with God. But because of the nature of the open source community and how these projects work, there's more of a gray area where Alan's favorite is the maintainer wins the lottery. They're no longer gonna be checking up on their open source project. What do you do then? Our other boss's favorite is they get hit by a bus. What do you do then? I'm gonna go with, they have an eat, pray, love moment and they travel the world to find themselves. They're not checking their email. <laughs> How do you track that? Especially at scale. So say we're going to assume, say we all agree that the date that we're concerned with is the last time the maintainer made a change to the open source project. Great, we have a date that we're worried about, we have a data point, lovely. However, how would you find that at scale? So say you're an organization, you have a system, that system is comprised of a bunch of different software components. Each of those software components have however many open source dependencies. You need to now find out when was the last change made on these open source projects for all of these open source dependencies. Is that feasible? I don't think so personally. So we've thrown a lot of questions at you and I feel like I'm sensing in your heads, the question is, are we there yet? Are we at the solution that you have promised us and you keep mentioning, ish? We propose that step one is shaping these shared definitions. So there can be a set of definitions for end of life, end of support, whatever we wanna call it, that work for proprietary software. 
and there can be a set of definitions that work for open source software. What we want is that sweet spot right in the middle, finding a set of definitions that works for both communities. And that's to ensure that we're speaking the same language and that we're, when we are talking about things and ta in, in the discussion, talking about solutions, that we all know what we're talking about. The best example I have for this is um, an ace in a deck of cards. It can be higher, it can be low. I care a lot because I like to win. And the value of the ace is important for me winning because it can be the difference from me losing and me winning. So before you start off, you say, hi, is the ace high or low for this game? And I might argue, um, but eventually you come to an agreement and then you can start the game once you're on the same page. That's what we want to do as we move forward with this discussion about the solution. And then coming back to that definition that I flashed in front of you earlier, that support is a reasonable expectation of a predictable, effective response to a new security risk. So we put this up here sort of as a straw man. This is our proposal for the shared definition that we need to talk about this problem with the entire software community. If you disagree, let us know. We would love to know. If you have a better definition, we'd also love to hear it. If you think we're right, I would also love to hear that. Um, now step two, focusing on transparency. We already know that transparency is critical for software and supply chain security. And we already have tools that let us communicate data information about our software components and move that, communicate that information from producer, maintainer, to consumer, user. And we can do that through tools like, or data models like SBOM, like VEX and CSAF. These are existing tools that we have for transparency. So can we leverage these as examples or a model for how we come up with how we're gonna communicate the information we need to about end of life and end of support data. And that is where our defined steps end. We think steps one and two are already a lot of work and the progress that we make on steps one and steps two, those shared definitions, the focus on transparency and leveraging the existing models that we have for communicating transparency how we move on forward with those will give us more information to better define step three, step four, and so on. But still, there are things that you can do right now and things that we are committed to doing that will help us move forward on those step one and step two to move forward later. It's me. Oh. All right, we're 30 minutes for the talk and only two people have left, so we're doing good. Uh, so. I told you, I teased this a little bit earlier, uh, what is Open EOX? So if you're familiar with the OASIS Open uh, International Standards, uh, it's an SDO. Um, Open EOX is a somewhat new initiative. We're approaching, I guess, being up and running for about a year. Uh, I'm the co-chair for uh, this uh, technical committee, uh, along with Omar Santos from Cisco. Um, what we are doing is focusing on creating a standard for uh, communicating end of life, end of support information in a machine readable automated fashion. And so uh, one thing, you know, first things first, we're gonna focus initially on being able to create this data and providing a lightweight schema. I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Uh, and and uh, independent schema as well for uh, both being able to integrate into existing tooling uh, that we have in the uh, supply chain domain, but also so it can stand alone. Once again, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Uh, we hope to, longer term goal, also specify a standard way of distributing this information, but first we gotta be able to create it. Um, and some of that work that we're doing is just what Victoria highlighted. Um, some of the work that we're doing right now is working on a common set of definitions. Can you go to the next slide? a common set of definitions um, that take into account the uh, proprietary world, software and hardware perspective, uh, as well as the open source community. Uh, we go two slides ahead. 
good organization. Uh, so this is a open project. Uh, it, um, yes, we do have an official technical committee. Um, we actually meet tomorrow um, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, if you want to uh, ask me about it after the meeting. But uh, we have uh, monthly TC meetings. We also work asynchronously to develop the standard, and we're working on these common set of definitions. But how OASIS is designed is you don't have to be an OASIS member. Um, you don't have to be a member of the TC to contribute. So GitHub project, uh, github.com, OASIS TCs, uh, open EOX. Please come. You see there's 21 issues, uh, at least as of last week when I made the screenshot. Uh, we have some of those definitions. Uh, uh, please look at them. Pick them apart. Say, yes, you're on the right track. We need more voices. We need more input. We would love to have your help. Uh, we're working uh, not only on that common set of definitions, but can you go one slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, we're also working on that first, a lightweight portable schema for OpenEOX that can be integrated into existing tools. So uh, something that can work in conjunction, let's say you have a mach machine readable version of end of life, end of support uh, data for uh, a product. You also have that product's SBOM, or maybe you have a security advisory related to that product or a VEX related to that product. You can tie that in in conjunction with that information. Really optimizes the support we can have from a product lifecycle perspective. Uh, we also are building it just to be able to stand alone. Uh, you can communicate this information in a machine-readable, automated way, um, but independently. Much kind of like VEX. Who's familiar with VEX? Uh, so VEX was built came out of the SBOM work. It's meant to be complementary and work in conjunction with SBOM. However, it can act uh, independently from SBOM, right? Some, the concept-wise, it's similar to VEX. Same with OpenEOX. It, it, it's meant to work in conjunction with these, stand, uh, these formats and standards. Uh, it can work with SPDX and Cyclone DX. Uh, however, it can also stand alone. All right? And one th you know, our intention, too, is for this to be useful cross sectors, cross communities, cross international governments that already have subtle differences in their policies or how they're approaching this problem. Uh, that's, that's the aim. We want this to be able to be folded into our risk uh, policies, our risk frameworks, and of course the tooling ecosystem that already exists. We're not wanting to reinvent any wheels. Uh, we want it to already fit into the ecosystem nicely. Next slide. Okay, you remember. So that's, that's how we're approaching this from a data layer perspective, communicating, creating and communicating the data. You remember I had the slide up earlier, National uh, Cybersecurity Strategy implement, Implementation Plan. This is where we're going to have to start looking into where do we put this data? Where do you, come, where do you get this data? Where is it going to be held? Harder problem to answer. Um, anybody familiar with this project, endoflife.date? Really, really cool project. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to check it out. One guy from India uh, is, is uh, running this project. As of this morning, I checked, 340 products. Um, you know, here's an example of a centralized database. Does it have everything? No. It has a lot of great information. It's definitely uh, sampled towards larger Software, to, uh, software companies that have this information already, right? They have this, they're more, more mature organizations, I guess for, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, that um, already have some sort of maybe publicly declared policies of how they handle end of life, and that data is publicly available, and he's gathered that data. So really, really, really cool project, but centralized databases are really hard. We know that when we are going to be looking at this problem, we're looking at a fed federated and aggregated model. Um, we know that a centralized one database to rule them all is probably not going to be the answer. Maybe, I'm not proposing, just throwing this out there. Would love to hear your thoughts. Would love to hear your ideas. Uh, or tell me this is a terrible idea. Uh, I work in the vulnerability management space. You can look at the, how we handle vulnerabilities. You have the NVD. You have the OSV. Those are both used in conjunction with each other. Um, it may be a model like that. We don't know. But that's just kind of an example as we start looking to, you know, we had the data layer model. Now we're starting to look at where do we put all this data? Where can people go to find it? Next. 
Oh, Mrs. Yu. So the software identity problem manages to work its way into so many other problems and complicate things. And that's because it's really important for most scalable solutions to the software problems we have that when I tell you I'm giving you information about software component A, you know exactly which software component I'm talking to you about and what I'm trying to communicate to you about that piece of software. The best I can explain this is I'm going to give you a non-software example that came up in my life recently. Um, I was telling everyone, I'm going to Vienna. I'm really excited. Um, I'm at Vienna, Austria. However, there is a Vienna in Virginia, um, right by Washington, D.C., and the difference is really important because I needed my passport and 20 hours of flights to get here from Washington, D.C. To get to Vienna, Virginia from my apartment in Washington, D.C. would have taken me 20 minutes and the metro card that I store in my phone. Big difference, um, and that difference is also really important for when we're talking about software component data. And CISA started working on this problem, uh, you may have seen last fall, um, we published a white paper that captured where the problem of software identification is right now and what possible paths forward do we have. We put that paper out for public comment because we wanted to hear from everyone out there did we capture the problem correctly? Did we miss anything? Is there a solution that we just missed out there? And what we learned from writing the paper and from reading the public responses is there is no universal identifier that's going to solve all of our problems. Justin stole my language earlier. I was gonna say there's no one ring to rule them all, but he stole that. And so there, if we don't have a super secret software identifier format that's going to solve all of our problems, then the problem becomes how do we operate in an environment where there are multiple identifiers at play? If we have to deal with Perl and CPE and Omnibore and maybe other software identifier formats, how do we navigate that and what are the next steps in doing that? That's what we're thinking about now. So in conclusion with all of this, the, this problem of end of life, end of support, or however else you want to define S is super important, but very complex. So to move the needle even a little bit, we would like to continue the conversation on EOL, EOS, general thoughts, definitions, is there a solution we missed? We want to continue to implement existing security models for transparency. That can be SBOM, that can be VEX, CSAF, anything else that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. We want to identify what we can do to better operate in a multiple software identifier format ecosystem. And we would like you all and us to participate in community efforts like Open EOX to come together, pool all of our brains and experiences together to come up with solutions. So if you think you have a magical solution to any of the problems that we've talked about, we would love to hear it. If you disagree vehemently with something that we said, we would love to hear it. And again, if we're just great, we would also love to hear that. Here's how you can contact us. Any of these emails, I will also flag um, the open EOX link and their GitHub and the SBOM email, if you don't have it, you didn't get a picture or something, if you go to sisa.gov slash SBOM, that email is all over the place. And it'll reach me and it'll reach Alan. Thank you. All right. Do we have, what time are we at, Victoria? We have like two minutes for questions. Anybody have questions or also, hey, you, uh, you guys are giving a talk on something that I've already solved. <laughs> Here's the solution. I don't know who was first, but uh, you can rock, paper, scissors for it if you want. Yeah. So the question was, 
agree with this problem as scoped from the proprietary software perspective, but since open source has maintainers, it doesn't have a, the information, where do we get this information about end of life, end of support? Yeah, so uh, we know and we recognize that it, it means something entirely different in this space. And also, depending on how that project is managed in terms of, I mean, is it tied to an a open source foundation? Is it tied to an organization? Is it just me sitting in my base it and people just like what I'm, I created, right? So there's a lot of different perspectives. And that's, you know, in this early stages of trying to solve these problems, that's why we... You know, that's why we're here talking about this problem because we are hoping that you guys can help us find out that answer. From your perspective, uh, is it not even a thing? From your perspective, this is how we've done it. Is it from your perspective, uh, this is how I know some people have handled it or are doing it. So we really, uh, you know, this is almost as much as uh, we hope we have answers to your questions, but can also uh, work as a brainstorming session, and we'd love to hear. Uh, if we have time, one more right here. Yeah, we, plug, okay. Go ahead. No, we don't have time. Um, oh, it's okay. 2.40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Justin and I are just like, going to stand right outside, and then we can take however many more questions. Yes, please come talk to us. Uh, thank you for attending the talk. We'd love to chat more. Uh, we're on the app, uh, the Linux events app, if you want to hit us up and meet. We'll be here all week. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.